Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tasia, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Today is Thursday, September the 16th, and this is your board of Multnomah County Commissioners and our regular meeting. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th of 2020, and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on June 24th, 2021, today's meeting is being held virtually. To align with social distancing guidelines, some rules associated with Board of County Commissioner meetings will be temporarily altered. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking. Before you present, check to make sure your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. May I have a motion on the consent calendar? Summoned. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Will the board clerk please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Corey? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Um, Opportunity for public comment on non agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it's your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you. I will set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, please wrap up your sentence. When you are done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Uh, Madam Chair, we received one submission for oral public testimony, which has been shared with board members and staff. Today's testimony is from Ron Vrooman. And uh, Ron, you uh, uh, are unmuted and you can begin. Thank you. Article 1, Section 1 of the Oregon Constitution. We declare that all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in right, that all power is inherent in the people, that all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness, and they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. Our Oregon Statewide Jural Assembly has notified the Fed, State of Oregon, all county DAs and sheriffs. We are Article 1, Section 1 on Oregon. They all acquiesced and defaulted to our stand. And our claim stands. This is our notification to you and our demand, stop infringing upon our unalienable rights and self-correct into a constitutional Republican form of government, or you will be removed. We are no longer received, pardon me, we are no longer deceived. You are notified this is a republic, not a democracy. You can reach us at www.orsja.org. Orsja.org. My name is Ron Vroman. I'm the old white man talking head for the Oregon Statewide Jural Assembly. And we are doing our very best to bring Oregon to a constitutional Republican form of government. This starts with you at the county level. You must return to a constitutional Republican form of government, not a corporate corporatocracy. That's not what you were elected for. You were elected to serve us. We declare that all men, when they have a social compact, are equal in right, that all power is inherent in the people, and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. They have at all times a right to alter, 
reform or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. I'm getting your charter now. We'll be examining your charter to see if you are operating properly. I think you're operating as a corporate Time. governance. I yield. Thank you. Keisha, shall we move to R1? Yes. R budget modification number DCA-010-22 capital project budget reallocation MCDC detention electronics. Summit. Second. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds approval of R1. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Chair Kapoor and the commissioners. Uh, my name is Lisa Whedon. I'm the DCA budget manager. With me today is Dan Zalko, facilities director, and Greg Hawker, capital program manager. Um, I'd like to start uh, by thanking all of you for your leadership and commi commitment to the health and safety of our community and staff. Your job has not been easy. And uh, as a community member and employee, I really appreciate the care and consideration you have shown. We are here today seeking board approval for budget modification DCA 10-22. This is a request to reallocate $1.8 million to upgrade detention electronics project at the Justice Center. This project is a capital improve it is within capital improvement fund 2507 program on 78205. What I mean by an allocation is we are not asking for new funds. Instead, we're seeking approval to transfer dollars uh, from other projects within the same fund. Therefore, this uh, is a budget neutral request and per FIN 15, any transfers within the capital program over 100,000 need board approval. A little background on this project. Under this project, the intercom and video surveillance systems will be upgraded to newer technology. And that's utilizing the same equipment and brands that were installed in other county detention facilities and have become the standard for the county. These standards are important as it in, uh, reduces the need for spare parts, decreases the uh, training time for new operations staff, and allows the maintenance staff to become experts and better maintain one set of systems as opposed to previously having to maintain five different technologies and brands. Additionally, after completion, this should extend the lifetime of the security electronics um, head end equipment for another seven, eight years with appropriate maintenance and software upgrade. A little background on the funding. In FY 2017, the County Board of Commissioners funded this project in the amount of $100,000, and that was really for the analysis and project plan development. Initially, the estimate for this project was $3.8 million, but after several rounds of solicitation and negotiation, the final contractor agreement was higher than anticipated. Uh, this led uh, to increased project soft costs um, since the initial uh, in estimates. Through fiscal year 2018 to 2021, the board has approved funding for this project totaling $5.6 million. With this reallocation, the, the total project budget will be $7.5 million. Where we are currently, uh, construction began in the fall of 2019. It was about 15% complete in the spring of 2020 and at the beginning of the pandemic and continued through protests in around the Justice Center. These unprecedented Presidented issues brought to project delays due to unforeseen scenic and social, but also social unrest, but also working in a congregate set, setting. Uh, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office facilities and the contractor followed uh, Center for Disease Controls and county guidelines and prioritized the safety of inmates, personnel, and contractors over the project schedule. This caused project delays, which in turn increased labor and contractor overhead. In addition, supply chain issues arose, which caused delay um, and shortage and increased costs in electronic components and materials. This request to reallocate the 1.8 million is budget neutral. All the funds reside in the CIP fund 2507. Um, once approved, it will fund the remainder of the project and assure completion in January of 2022 and close out of March of 2022. This final phase of the project budget, the 1.8 million, will fund uh, 1.4 million to the primary contractor, AU, and the remainder will be going to uh, ATS low voltage cable, the architect, and then the county trades and management. 
So our re uh, allocation plan, we've identified um, five projects. Uh, these projects were identified as ones either that could be canceled due to it no longer being deemed necessary or where uh, there were more funds budgeted in FY22 than spent in this year due to the duration of the project. This reallocation will have no impact on county services, clients, or departments. Additional funding for these projects, other than the bridge shop roof, which has been canceled, will be considered in the upcoming FY 2023 capital budget process. So the five projects, the bridge shop replacement roof has been canceled. There's two projects in the Justice Center. One is for the generator and the other for disc readers, one in the need to upgrade the elevators. And then the last is the Dion, um, at Yon to replace the distribution and to transfer switch. Phew, I'll take a breath and thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you, Dan or Greg, did you have anything to add or just here for questions? Just here for questions, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Um, Tasia, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, uh, call on commissioners, see who has questions or comments. We'll start with Commissioner Jayapal. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Lisa. Just one question to make sure I understand. When you mentioned that there are five projects, that the, the reallocation comes from five projects were deemed no longer necessary, is, is that typical in sort of a, a project of the scope that you continue to reassess as you go along and, and you know, realize that things that were originally in scope are, are no longer necessary? Uh, yeah, so there's there's only one project being canceled and that's the, the roof project. The others are going, the project is gonna continue with phase one of the funding available for this fiscal year. And then, yeah, our typical process for capital um, project budgeting is then to reevaluate and reassess the projects and the project funding needs. And then we develop the next year's annual budget as well as the uh, four years out. So we prepare a five year budget for the capital projects. Got it. So, so one project canceled, the other four will be considered for 23. Right. Well, the funding, they're, they're being uh, completed now with year one funding. And then the continued funding to finish out those remainder of those projects will be considered in 23. Right. Thank you. No other questions. You're welcome. Great question. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Commissioner Stigman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lisa and Dan, for being here. Just one quick question. Uh, so, Lisa, you did refer, uh, made mention uh, about the supply chain issues, and I just kind of wanted uh, to hear, are, are, are we concerned? Because I do know that supply chain issues are a big deal right now. How confident are we uh, on the remaining work that needs to be done, and have we locked in uh, those uh, services and those materials? Yeah, and I'll pass that one to Dan. Good morning, Chair Kafore and commissioners. It's nice to be with you today. So, uh, Commissioner uh, Stegman, the it's a great question, and we've spent a lot of time the last few months forecasting the remaining funding needs based on how challenging this particular project has been. Uh, most of the challenges have been related to COVID. Um, between positive cases and quarantining, there have been many times over the last year and a half where we've had to stop the contractor, delay things, move things around. That's been the primary driver for this. The supply chain issues are, are a factor too. And what the project manager, J JD DeChamps, Greg Hawker and I have done is really put conservative forecasts on the remaining project need. So this 1.8 million we believe is sufficient. Um, we do have some remaining uh, products to procure, but a large majority are already here. Um, so we don't believe the risk is very great. There is still a small risk and that's a great point, but we believe the forecast is conservative to account for the remaining products. Great. Thank you, Dan. I, I appreciate that. I know you, there's no guarantee in anyone's crystal ball, uh, but it sounds like you all have uh, thought deeply about this. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we've been working on this project for, for years, so I'm glad to see it uh, come to completion and to fruition. Thank you. Thank you all. I know that we have had some unexpected challenges with this project, but it is necessary and we will 
get it finished. Um, all right, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Roll call vote. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? And Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. Thank you. R2, R2 budget modification number DCJ-005-22 adds two FTE corrections counselors in DCJ assessment and referral center housing. So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds approval of R2. Good morning, Chair Kapori, Commissioners. Adam Brown here from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. I use he, him pronouns. I'm here with Leave Jensen from the Department of Community Justice. Thank you for having us here this morning. So the Joint Office and DCJ are seeking board approval of budget modification DCJ-005, which adds two positions in DCJ using a portion of the $500,000 of Metro Supportive Housing Services measure funding allocated for housing focused services for justice involved individuals that was originally budgeted as contractual services. As you right, might remember from the fiscal year 2022 budget process, the joint office's Metro measure budget contains a number of housing, uh, sorry, a number of cross departmental investments, including this one in the Department of Community Justice. Nothing is changing relative to the programming approved in the budget. This action just reallocates a portion of the funding to support two corrections counselors aligning the budget with programmatic needs by providing the staffing necessary for the tailored housing focused support and coordinated services. We would have included these positions in the adopted budget, but the service delivery specifics weren't fully developed when this, when we submitted our department requested budget. Uh, and with that, Lee and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Good to see you leave. Good to see you, Adam. Um, Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. All right, uh, Commissioner Stegman, we'll start with you this time. Thank you, uh, excuse me, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lee and Adam. Uh, I did have a question. Could you maybe just talk a little bit more about more specifically what the correctional counselors will be doing on a daily basis? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, on a daily basis, they're going to be doing the outreach to make sure that we're able to utilize these funds and provide the rent assistance for justice involved individuals um, and justice involved individuals include those who are coming out of prison and jail and those who've been impacted by the justice system. It's also hopefully going to encourage other state programs that are coming on board to maximize the utilization of those rental assistance programs and long term rental assistance of programs from the Metro fund. This will make it possible to remove those barriers of application, moving into the unit, maintaining that unit and making sure that there's a coordinated effort for the support. So they literally will be on the ground from the time they get up in the morning and they end their day um, and working not only with our current providers, but trying to expand the portfolio that we currently access um, in being able to access additional units and removing those barriers. Thank you, Lee. That's that's very helpful. So I guess my question is, is that will these uh, two positions, will, will they be working specifically with people immediately exiting uh, our, our prisons and jails? Or is it also people that uh, are currently houseless? Both. Okay. We will be working with our providers to make referrals. One of the things that we've learned, especially right now with the state assistance, rent assistance, we are learning that more and more people are struggling trying to figure out just the website. So we are making that our focus right now so that we can ensure that they're accessing that rent assistance. And we also know that we need to do more outreach as time goes on to make sure that we can expand that portfolio. Love it. Thank you so much, Lee. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Adam and Lee. Um, I, one question I had. So it looked like these, this was originally set up to be contractual positions, but that we're actually bringing them on site to for um, permanent D DCJ staff. Um, 
that's right. Was that is that was that just as um, a result of looking at like how the how the dollars and how the staffing could be best would would be best needed to really reach the goals of getting um, people into housing who are justice involved individuals. Absolutely. We have access to information and resources, and also it makes it possible for us to make sure that it's for a longer term, that we're able to work with this individual as time requires, um, and making sure that we're able to facilitate working with all the providers and partners. There's no conflict because there's a variety of providers that we're working with so that we can make sure that we're working with everyone at the table, including our county partners. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, no questions. Uh, just really glad to hear the specifics of how that Metro housing uh, money is also being used for this, this very specific group of folks. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you all as well. And I'll, I'll just say that, um, although this is a, a small investment in the grand scheme of the overall measure, in fact, it's just under 1% of the overall uh, Metro supportive housing services funding. It, I think it really shows the significant impact that uh, these positions will have in the lives of folks who really need it. And I want to thank you, especially Lee, for your long time dedication. I don't know how many countless lives that you have helped save and people you have helped house. And I am grateful for you. And thanks, Adam. All right, uh, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. R3. Okay. Budget modification number HD 00922, moving 1.2 million of State CARES Act funding from non departmental to health for vaccine incentives. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R3. Good morning, Health Department team. Good morning. Um, this is Wendy Lear, Health Department Deputy Director. And we have a just a short PowerPoint presentation to help walk us through um, this budget modification. So thank you and good morning. So um, this is a um, uh, not a new funding, not additional funding, but moving 1.2 million dollars of state CARES Act funding from non-departmental to the health department. Next slide. Um, the budget, just as a reminder, in uh, July, the board approved budget modification 003-22 for 4.2 million dollars in state CARES Act funding to increase vaccination rates. And of that 4.2 million dollars, 3 million of it was um, allocated to the health department to stand up uh, vaccine events and clinics, and 1.2 million was set aside in non-departmental. So next slide. Um, this is just a little bit of a breakdown, more detail on that budget modification, and so of the 3 million dollars that was attributed to the health department. For a little over 400,000 was for staffing. $157,000 was for uh, food and other supplies for the event. And both of those items are kind of on budget and we expect to expend that by the end of September. Um, then another $720,000 was um, dedicated to uh, community based partner um, vaccine clinics. And there have been multiple REACH events. Uh, led by REACH through uh, July and se through September. Another half million dollars was uh, committed to um, other wraparound partners and community-based partners. And our public health division has uh, contracted with 36 community partners to support their vaccine events with that half million. And then finally, $1.2 million was set aside for the health department clinics, both the, the clinics run by our integrated clinical services, our community health services uh, clinics and public health clinics. And um, the, we have issued uh, $1.2 million in incentive gift cards 
um, we we utilize that funding through the end of um, or through the middle of August. And then finally, um, then the set aside that we're talking about today is in non-departmental. So next slide. So um, just a little bit of additional information because um, uh, we have um, already expended that 1.2 for vaccine incentives and we continue to issue incentives. I wanted to give you a recap on some of the funding that we've utilized. So we had the $1.2 million um, given to us in the original budget modification in July. Today, we're here asking for an additional 1.2. In addition to that, though, for, for vaccine incentive gift cards only, so not, not accounting for the other costs, we had um, $98,000 in CARES Act funding where we had purchased gift cards last fiscal year and hadn't distributed them. So we um, have been using those and distributing those as vaccine incentives. And um, we also in public health have identified salary savings from their um, program offer uh, 401998, which is the public health community testing vaccination and distribution uh, program offer. They've identified salary savings of a little more than half a million dollars. And so we have repurposed that and reduced the personnel expenses and increased uh, the uh, client assistance uh, funding in that budget. And then here is how we have um, spent or the, the trajectory of spending um, the incentive gift cards uh, funding. So we've spent the first million to through the middle of August, we expect that this additional um, million to, and I'm not sure why it has a million for in that slide, but yeah, the additional amount will be spent through uh, the end of October. And then uh, the reach part that the additional funding also will, um, I, I'm sorry, the uh, $1.4 million is the balance that remains of the revenue uh, that we have available given the 3.05 million above. And so we will spend another 1.4 on vaccines from August through the first part of October. We are also, um, we also sponsored some REACH partner events um, for $250,000 um, that were back to school events we also um, funded a future generations collaborative and a corrections health community um, back to school event um, in August. And so that will fully expend uh, the $3 million we have set aside for vaccine parity funding. So next slide. I think I'm turning it over to Jessica at this point. Well, this is just visual to say that we're gonna spend this by the end of October. Um, uh, the first week of October, the $1.2 million. Go ahead, Jessica. Good morning, everybody. Jessica Grinzi, Public Health Director at Multnomah County Health Department. It's nice to see everybody this morning. Um, next slide, please. I apologize if you can hear my coffee machine in the background. Um, so just a little bit about the impact of the vaccine incentive program. Um, I'm really pleased to report that we're seeing um, a really strong impact on the uptake of vaccine as a result of, um, at least in part, by the uh, gift card program. So um, just to give you a sense of how this is operating, everyone age 12 and above gets who gets a COVID-19 vaccine um, through our clinics um, qualifies for a Visa gift card as available. There are some situations where we might be short-staffed where we actually have to mail the, uh, mail the gift cards out, but um, for the vast majority of them, we've been able to <clears throat> give them out on site. Big thanks to our business service partners and other folks that have helped staff that from the department. That's been an amazing quick build out of staffing. So um, the, the, the way this works is um, folks who are getting their first dose of Pfizer and Moderna get a $100 gift card um, for their second dose for both Pfizer and Moderna, they get a $50 gift card. And then if you're getting the J&J, the one vaccine, one dose vaccine, you get 150. We also have a program 
um, that we refer to as friend and family or ambassador program, which is really built on some best practice out of the STD HIV realm in testing and treatment. Um, and this uh, allows for folks that have been vaccinated um, that show proof of their own vaccination to come in with up to eight people to get an additional $50 per person, um, bringing folks in to get their um, vaccination. And again, we've um, done this extensively in the STD HIV realm um, to really bolster that social network work that um, really needs to happen. Um, and then adults accompanying minors that are age 12 to 17 that are not their own children are not eligible for bring a friend, bring a friend incentives. So um, obviously we're looking really carefully at the kind of nuances to all of this, especially with young folks. Um, currently, um, we're, we're looking at our ID policy. Um, this is all evolving um, practice, um, but right now at the public health clinics, no ID is necessary to receive a gift card. Um, however, we ask, we ask each recipient to sign or initial a log to acknowledge that they have received the vaccination. Next slide, please. Um, so these uh, incentive, the incentive program has taken place over a couple different settings, as Wendy pointed out, public health with our ongoing fixed clinics, vaccine clinics like the one at Fabric Depot. Um, and um, also our mobile clinics in partnership with, with community based agencies. Um, integrated clinical services um, has also integrated uh, the gift card program and Jeff will be talking a little bit about that. And then, as Wendy pointed out, we've also been able to distribute the gift cards to community based agencies who are doing partner events, which has helped um, bolster their their work in the community as well. So, um, from July 15th to September 4th, we had um, 200 more than at this point, more than 235 vaccine events that offered incentives. Next slide. So, um, you know, the, the, the graphs tell, tells the story. So you can see here um, that uh, on the, the orange, I'm not sorry on your screen if it's orange or yellow, but on my screen it's orange, the arrow pointing down um, towards uh, the dot over July um, indicates that the implementation of the gift card program, and you can see a steady climb up um, uh, to uh, through uh, August, our increase in vaccine doses administers were observed over that time, most notably on July 10th. 17th, 30th, uh, July 30th, and August 14th. Um, so uh, again, this we have not, there are other factors that are helping to increase the uptake of vaccination, like people taking the Delta variant very seriously and the amount of disease in the community, as well as um, many employers are uh, implementing vaccine mandates. So there's a combination of things going on here, but undoubtedly we're hearing from folks that come into the um, vaccination clinics that, you know, having a gift card program that helps offset the costs of them seeking vaccine, which is the way we've always looked at it and framed it and really heard from community around the need for that um, has helped tremendously. Next slide. And I think I'm turning it over to Jeff. Yes, you are. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Perry and I am the finance officer for ICS. And wanted to just give you a quick update as to where ICS has been and how we've actually been able to leverage uh, this program in itself. And I do want to tell you, as of last week, I mean, we've administered almost 21,000 vaccinations. So, you know, the program in itself is just doing very well and we're able to, you know, get a good push here. You know, for example, at, at Park Rose in July and August, we had, you know, we vaccinated over 467 clients. Um, We've seen um, youth and family were largely seen at our Fabry Depot location, and we served almost over 2,400 clients in July and August. We actually been able to leverage uh, those dollars to hold up two events in August that included not only the COVID uh, vaccinations, but also we included um, pediatric vaccinations in preparation for return to school. And this even included um, food carts and, and giveaways. So. All in all, as you see, you know, with our trend when we started in July, I mean, it has been a. Uh, you know, very widespread and it's been, you know, really just creeping, you know, up, which is the direction that we actually wanted to see it. So I'm just happy to say it, it is working and it is bringing people through the door. And that's all I have to say. And I think we go to the next slide. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so, uh, Last night, we turned in our um, equity report update to the state, um, and this was part of our report that shows, um, 
you know, really what we're trying to drive towards, which is um, closing the gap um, in uh, vaccination uptake amongst BIPOC communities. So what you see here is um, percent populations with completed vaccines uh, sequences using a methodology called rarest race and ethnicity. Um, obviously for Multnomah County, the compare is May to August. So the difference in those blue and orange bars shows you the jump um, in that time that um, we implemented uh, the gift cards um, versus when we did not have them. So again, um, gathering information from community about helping to offset the costs um, to get vaccinated, we can see that um, this has helped quite a bit in our overall equity strategy. Next slide, please. And then just another way to look at this is um, comparing the magnitude of difference between um, when you compare white um, non Latinx rates um, to uh, BIPOC communities. So um, again, the blue and orange bars show um, the difference in percentage of population um, between BIPOC communities and white non Latinx coming down, which is we want to see that gap close. So um, what those two graphs tell us is that um, this is helping us move uh, those, close those gaps moving forward. Um, as I said, uh, we know that there's a combination of factors that are influencing people's decisions, but we know that this is definitely helping and we're very pleased that we're gonna be able to maintain it for a while. Next slide. Actually, Teja, I think that might be it, is that right? I think so, it's not advancing anymore. Well, thank you. Um, Tasia, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair, we did not. Great, well, I will uh, call on commissioners to see who has questions or comments. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Wendy and Jessica and um, Jeff. Really appreciate the information. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, you know, well, I'll start with a comment, which is that that percent increase in vaccination chart by race and ethnicity. That's great. I mean, that that I think to me um, kind of captures what it is that you're trying to do here. A couple of questions. I'm wondering whether there's any national research about the effectiveness of incentives. As you pointed out, Jessica, it's really hard to tease out all of the reasons why those vaccinations rates are going up. I mean, intuitively and logically, it makes sense that there's a connection, but I'm curious about whether there's research out there. Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, um, we've done this for a very long time, over 20 years in the STD HIV realm related to, <clears throat> excuse me, social networks, um, bringing folks in for um, HIV testing or STD screening or seeking um, early treatment for HIV. So we definitely can share some research with you in that realm. It's been a really strongly demonstrated good best practice. We've used it in needle exchange as well to expand our harm reduction work. So in public health, we're very comfortable with this. Um, it's definitely helped to boost um, a lot of our services. And again, it, it, in talking to different communities, the usage of this, it really offsets the cost in many different ways of people seeking a service. So I think that's a really important distinction when you're talking about um, helping to um, provide service. Um, so yeah, we can share that offline for sure. Yep, I'd be interested. And yes, absolutely, that distinction between you know, offsetting cost versus it's it's like a lottery. It's like a special gift that you get. I think that makes that logically makes a really big difference. And then um, another kind of a little bit of a detailed question, but on the graph that showed the the gap between Asian community and white, I was a little surprised to see a gap because in the past we've seen information that rates of vaccination among Asian community writ large, which we know masks a lot of disparity, but writ large was pretty much equal to white. And I'm wondering, is that because that in that graph it includes Pacific Islander? Is that what's making the difference? I'm guessing so, but I can check. And it's also just a time, it's only May to August. So I can I can follow up with um, the data folks on that for sure. Great. I'd be curious. That's it. Thanks very much. Commissioner Vicki Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, um, Jessica and Jeff and Wendy, um, for the for the presentation and for the the information. It was really interesting to see. Um, I will, you know, I just wanted to note, you know, we still for the Latinx population, we're still under fifty percent, and I know that there's been a lot of work over the months to try to incent um, 
the Latinx population to get vaccinated and a lot of work done in um, in bilingual ways and bicultural ways. And I appreciate that. Um, I was at El Grito yesterday and was able to walk around um, and see all of the different booths and all the different information was there. And it was really wonderful to see the Multnomah County Public Health there giving out vaccines. And I think I talked to um, Roberto and he was saying that there were like about 200 vaccines um, yesterday. So I, that's that's great. And I think I'm just continuing to, to, to meet people where they're at and to take advantage of these kinds of um, events and opportunities is, is fantastic. Um, because we still have a lot of work to do there. Um, but um, I did read something, I think recently that said, Overall, in Multnomah County, though, we are we we have made up the difference between BIPOC and white population vaccination rates. Is that did I? Um, but it looks different than the magnitude of difference um, here. Looking at this, was it, did I mishear that? Um, I thought that was something that the state came out with recently. Yeah, we're we're not we're not at the same level as non non Hispanic white yet across BIPOC communities. Some communities are. But we still are lagging behind in Black, African American, um, Latinx. Um, in a, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. So we're not quite at that place yet. I will say that the rate of pickup that we're seeing is faster in BIPOC communities than non-BIPOC communities. So that might have been what they were saying. But we still have a gap. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what this chart showed pretty clearly. But um, but I, it's great to hear about the rate. And I think the incentives have something to do with, you know, have a, a lot to do with that. Um, so just like doing the rough math for this 1.2 million, you know, that we're allocating, and that's going to go directly to the to, to the incentive cards and the gift cards, as you described. Is that are we? I mean, that's about 8,000, right? Like 8,000 cards if you're doing it at 150. I know that's probably not an exact number, but that's what we're, you know, that's kind of like the rate at which we're going through them to take us through October with that. Um, is that is that about right? Like how much we expect to get from from the allocation we're doing today? Yeah, it Wendy, should get us through the through the first part of October if we stretch it, and that includes both the vaccine incentives, but also the ambassador um, incentives as well. Okay, that's great though. That could you know potentially be eight thousand more people vaccinated here in the in the county than we see before. Okay, um, those are all my questions. Thank you. I'm sorry, Commissioner Stegman, but Frankie has a question that he would like to ask next, if you don't mind. No, apparently not. He's his questions were answered, so we will go on to you, Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. It's it's nice to see uh, animals and kids. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, Jeff and Wendy and Jessica. I, I don't know if you all feel sometimes like. Um, oftentimes, we're uh, our folks are criticized about you know we're not doing enough. Um, but I see you all showing up here every day and seeing what we're doing right uh, is something that I am, am so very proud of uh, talking about. Uh, and as you know, has made mentioned, you know, I've been to multiple community events. Like I think you said, 235 vaccine events between July 15th and September 4th. That's a lot of events. So you know, I mean, I think we just kind of gloss over these numbers and we don't really think about. The hard work, uh, the CBOs work. And, I mean, a lot goes into these events. And uh, I know when I went to the Chinese festival uh, and and El Grito, that you know it was great to see people uh, getting their vaccinations. And I got a flu shot last night there. So you know, I mean, you're really leveraging. You know, and I know you were talking about other you know vaccinations for our kids, but you know that's what it really takes is thinking about you know how can we leverage. Uh, the work that we're already doing to help our community. So my hats off to you. And you know, I think that we we are clearly we are in a race, especially with all of our kids that have gone back to school. And and you probably heard that Reynolds, uh, there's been an outbreak and they're going to shut down for a couple of days. So, uh, but I did have one question. So we have a school-based health center at Reynolds, and so can youth go you know if you're 12 or over uh, high school uh you can go and get a vaccine uh just like at our student health centers my first question my second question is that i know typically it's is it just for youth i mean could parents go and get a vaccine at a student health center or or not i 
I'll jump in and Jeff, if you have additional information as well, um, we absolutely are providing vaccinations um, at school based health centers. Um, I would have to ask our ICS colleagues about the, the parent access. I'm not totally sure about that. Um, just one thing that I do want to say, though, first of all, thank you for your um, uh, kudos to the teams. You know, I always want to say our folks are out there day in, day out. Really, they've been doing it for months and months and months over a year. Amazing teams. They are the bread and butter. They are awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, with the Reynolds situation, I do just want to say that <clears throat> while they have had cases at rental Reynolds, um, the the change to CDL um, also has to do with a staffing balance. Um, so when when schools have to move to CDL and in person, it becomes a staffing issue. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, it's we're not looking at a school closure event that's a result of a big outbreak. Great. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure um, I, I would love to find out, you know, I mean, any opportunities for people to have access to, to vaccines, um, the more opportunities as we've seen uh, results in, in higher uptake. So uh, the more opportunities that we can provide uh, to parents who may be taking their, their children to the school based health centers, uh, if there was a way for us to provide that for other family members, I think that would be amazing. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for this incredible work. What you're doing is working and uh, it's very much appreciated. Thank you, Wendy, Jessica, and Jeff for giving us the rundown of the gift card incentive program. Um, and I think along the lines of what Commissioner Segment just said, we're definitely in, this is a, a good problem because we're in this position because of the real increase in vaccine demand. But even the solution of using additional 1.2 million dollars in funding is still only a stopgap because we're going to run out by the end of September or early October, which it's hard to believe that is just weeks away. Um, I think that this program has been too effective and too important to sunset. So I've sent a letter to the state advocating for additional funding that would allow us to continue this program through the end of the year. So hopefully we can get the support that we need to keep shrinking the vaccine disparities and move in a direction that keeps our entire community healthy and safe. And with that, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kaforian? Aye. The budget modification is approved. Thank you. R4, Infant Mortality Awareness Month Proclamation. I moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R4. Good morning, Larisha. Are you kicking it off? Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. Um, good morning, Chair Kapori and Commissioners Myron, Jaya Paul, um, Vega Peterson, and Stegman. Um, for the record, my name is Larisha Baker, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the health department's maternity child family health director and um, our deputy director for public health. So I'm here this morning with my colleague and community partner who will each introduce themselves as we um, continue the presentation to talk to you all about infant mortality. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity to come before you and our community to, pre to present this proclamation proclaiming September as Infant Mortality Awareness Month and to remind us all of the importance of early and appropriate prevention strategies. Um, next slide, please. Do we even have the slides up? I can't see them. We do now. now. There we go, okay. Thank you. Okay, so slide number two. Okay, September is National Infant Mortality Awareness Month and so we, again, are celebrating and bringing awareness to the significance of reaching 366 days of life. Um, the Celebrate Day 366 Every Baby Deserves a Chance Infant Mortality Awareness Campaign is sponsored by the National Healthy Start Association 
and supports and inspires people from around the nation to take action in support of Healthy People 2030 goal to improve the health and well-being of women, infants, children, and families. And in maternal child family health, we like to broaden that to um, women, men, infants, children, people, and families. Next slide, please. So why focus on infant mortality and why is infant mortality awareness important? It's important for us to recognize day 366 because every baby deserves a chance to reach this milestone. We believe every child born deserves to not only reach day 366, but to also have a healthy start to reach their lifelong full potential. At the beginning of the 20th century, the U.S. infant mortality rate was a staggering 100 deaths per 100 per 1,000 live births. Um, in 2020, the infant mortality rate in the U.S. was 5.8 deaths per 1,000. And over the last year, we have seen a slight decline by just over 1%. And though this is positive, the U.S. consistently is slower to improve our high mortality um, infant death rate compared to other industrialized countries. Next slide, please. So who is most impacted and why? In 2017, non-Hispanic Black mothers experienced the highest infant mortality rate among all racial and ethnic groups, close to 11 infant deaths per 1,000, as well as the highest rates of preterm birth delivery. Um, this is delivery before 36 weeks of gestation and low birth weight, both of which are leading causes of infant death. Mothers who are American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, or um, other Pacific Islander also experience the high, higher than average infant mortality rate at 9.21 and 7.64 per 1,000. The infant mortality rate among Hispanic mothers is similar to the national average at 5.10 per 1,000. And while these rates um, among white and Asian mothers are lower than average, they are at 4.7 and 3.8 per, um, per 1,000. In Multnomah County in 2018, the infant mortality rate for black African-American children was, was 10.5 per 1,000. Um, and for clients that received services in HBI, it was 3.95. For white Multnomah County residents, that rate was 3.73 per 1,000. In 2019, the overall rate for Multnomah County 4.3 per 1,000. And so why this matters? This relates to whether there are strong, healthy social systems and conditions in place before, during, and after birth. This relates to social determinants such as um, equity, poverty, and prenatal care. Next slide, please. So what works to eliminate these risks? There are many elements that contribute to health, and we know early childhood development is influenced by biology, experiences, and our environment. We know that the more positive experiences one has, the better the health outcomes, and programs such as Healthy Birth Initiatives are an essential part of our Black, African American, and African immigrant communities and culture in addressing infant mortality. By comparison to our national race, Multnomah County fares better and has more favorable outcomes than our national average. However, racial disparities persist in our community. As an example, um, though not under ideal circumstances under over the last year and a half due to COVID, HBI, along with our other maternal child family health programs, have continued to serve families through modified services through telehealth visits. We have expanded services by partnering with community-based organization, African Family Health Holistic Organization, um, and HBI also overlays these services with our evidence-based model nurse family partnership. We are we are working closely with our systems partners such as Providence and Legacy to address racism in the healthcare system. And through COVID and beyond, case managers work with families supporting them with much needed services such as rental assistance, gift cards, um, much needed diapers, wipes, air filters, and fans. This last year and a half has been especially challenging for all of our staff, programs, and families in the wake of COVID. And I want to extend my, um, my gratitude and thank our entire maternal, soon to be parent child family health staff for their tireless hard work, their dedication, and continuing to respond to our communities in need while living through COVID. 
themselves. Um, it's been, been really difficult and they have done an exceedingly outstanding job and continue to do so. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over um, to Disha who will introduce her, herself. Um, she's our new, new employee to HBI. So, good morning. Um, my name is Disha Reed Holden. I am the HBI program specialist. And the Healthy Birth Initiatives program is a culturally specific program that serves Black pregnant families here in Multnomah County. Um, we provide services based on the needs that are in the community, and that includes um, case management um, under the banner of the Nurse Family Partnership and the, the policy layout that they have. It also includes prenatal and childbirth education classes, male and fatherhood engagement, and case management for uh, male partners, and resources for new parents and babies through age two. And most importantly with HBI, our services are open to black families regardless of income, because we know that the, that the disparities that black women face in regards to maternal mortality and morbidity are not, there are no parameters for income. It's all across the board. And so we serve all black families here in the Multnomah County area. Thank you. We can now move to um, our community partner, Susie. Good morning, Susie. Thank, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to be here. And thank you, Chair Kafore and all commissioners for what you do to support um, all of the parameters that you uh, touch in creating the our safe communities. So. Um, and as some of you know, I have the privilege of being a part of the Future Generations Collaborative. Um, and for the purposes of, of today's discussion, um, you know, uh, we'll focus on life is sacred. Um, that's a traditional value. And in acknowledging that life is sacred, uh, we seek to invite it, nurture it, and celebrate it. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, a graphic that explains a bit about the Future Generations Collaborative. Uh, we, our mission is to uh, support, grow the health and uh, of our families. And in so doing, we recognize that as a, as a result of historic trauma, boarding schools, and a lot of factors, uh, substance use as a self-medication injured uh, our communities and our families and created the incidence and prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So that is at the heart of our mission, but when we hold that at the center of our basket, then what we realize that surrounds it is um, how we can show up uh, to create mitigation, to create resilience, uh, to have an approach that uses our culture, in a strength-based way to really create that resilience. In other words, the FGC, like so many um, of, of our organizations, our collaboratives, as we're creating resilience and health through collaborative, uh, culturally uh, oriented strategies. And so within that, uh, for the FGC, we have a four-part modal or approach that allows us to look really holistically across the lifespan. And so, yes, we're growing this healthy, healthy start, but part of the reasons that, reason that we do is because we understand that fetal alcohol spectrum imp impacts across all systems and all uh, stages of development. So we have the educating mode that does training and we do have the um, 
engagement mode that is really critical to engaging quite literally the community and then uh, we want to you know tell the story by our research and evaluation and we want to affect policy through the policy wheel next slide so within that then we recognize that culture is protection you know it's it's that protective and so we i feel that we are gifted and blessed as indigenous people to have what some might call strategies but they are the traditions they are the values the knowledge that our ancestors brought forth and so when we show the cradle board here uh holding and and nestling the baby in the infant board we understand that we are creating nurture uh and we are being traditional but we are also creating those first that first piece of self-regulation we are promoting observation and uh we are helping a child know where they are in space uh the center is um, in what we call an infant nest which is maybe uh, more contemporarily oriented, but with materials and things that remind us of what our grandmothers showed us and creates that safe spot for uh, nesting and play and pays attention to the sensory and the tactile pieces and then the bolster for timey time and all of that. And then of course the hammock on the right uh, gives, uh, we can call it clinical uh, in terms of vestibular development, or we can understand that once again, it settles and soothes the baby. And so we are, we are privileged to be able to bring forward the traditions and in that way, bring the past present to inform our futures. Uh, next slide. Uh, we, uh, like so many cultures, we not only appreciate uh, and value our elders, but we know that they are integral to uh, our ability to serve holistically and nurture. Uh, so these very teachings that I was just sharing, uh, the stories that they bring to us, uh, these that this is, contributes uh in a really positive way and nurturing way to the development from prenatal through postnatal through the first years of life because one of the things that you see in this slide is a picture of one of our storytellers that you might be familiar with ed edmo and he joins us on a weekly basis uh to share with children and parents uh, the positive stories of our, our being, of our identity. And what we know is that when we guide by storytelling, we don't do it from a seat of judgment, but rather of a uh, moves us forward to something good. So next slide. So one of the projects that we've really, it's just been a tremendous privilege uh, for this last year. Uh, we're really grateful for the county and uh, for um, the Help Me Grow project to grow, literally grow um, our children and our families from the context of a playscape. Uh, Chagu uh, Hayush is the name of the playscape. Uh, Chagu Makilush is a, uh, translates to help me grow. But we use that outdoor siding as a COVID responsive landscape, playscape. And, and some of you, um, uh, I think, were a part of that initial uh, opening event that we did last year. But we, what we did within that playscape is to create a natural and traditional setting that would also hold an outdoor COVID responsive classroom and do it, uh, really grew it from CDC guidelines as well as our traditional values. And so it has been kind of a hub of providers and families coming together and a great place for referral and sharing of information for everyone. And so these are just a couple of, of pictures of, uh, what is has really turned in to be really a, a tremendous joy and pleasure and has, let's see if we can look at the next slide. Um, this is a graphic that sort of shows what, what, what all circulates uh, within the context of that setting, which is, of course, at the center is the child and family. But within any given Friday, we have providers from health, Early Head Start, Head Start, Tennyson with Naya, um, Early Intervention, Morrison Center, uh, so play therapy, all of those 
providers, but coming together for those hours also with parents and children. So there, it is a very much a non-stigmatic, non-hierarchical way of coming together and sharing and then having the materials that are, yes, they speak to and reflect what we look for within the context of things like the ages and stages questionnaire, but rather than doing it stigmatically, we do it within the context of traditional toys and activities so that that whole concept of loving our child's development is an extension that you know we learn from preconceptual through conceptual gestation all the way through um, and again it's been a real pleasure at this point we're having a bit of a pause uh, because of the variant and so we have grown some more of our virtual responses and we have a, a three groups right now that we're doing where we I've always we do a, a Tuesday night parent child support circle where there are presentations of art and I love you books from the children and parents and then Friday gathering and then a Wednesday infant group which would circles it right back to where we are right now so thank you so much for your time and for what you all always do to support not only the future generations uh, project but future generations quite literally for all across all cultures. Thank you, Susie. Larisha, are you up next? I am. Daisha? Yes. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so HBI is um, is actively partnered with several organizations in the area to support the reduction of infant and maternal mortality. So we have the COVID-19 Community Resource Group and HBI co-chairs that group and serves as liaisons to combine several different services across Multnomah County to keep, make sure, to make sure that everyone is in the loop in reference to how things are changing with COVID and how that affects us being able to serve our families. Um, the Providence Health System has a has restructured their policies to support doulas and are now offering full scholarships to have BIPOC community members trained um, and certified as doulas to serve here in the community. We also have the HBR Community Action Network, we call it the CAN. Um, the CAN was created to be a area where we can bring community members together to meet monthly to discuss and then make action on things that we can do as community members to improve birth and health outcomes for Black families. And so our September meeting, which took place just last night, actually included some of our local legislators for Oregon to who came and spoke with us about what we can do as community members to further the efforts that they're making in legislation to improve birth outcomes for black women and incarcerated women here in Oregon. We also have the Baby Boosters Initiative who has partnered with the Rose CDC and others, and they make affordable, safe, and supportive housing for families. And they prioritize the mid and outer Southeast Portland area and the metro area. We have uh, partnerships with the Black Parent Initiative, who provides the doulas, parenting, and lactation support that is culturally specific for Black families. We also have partnership with the OHA Maternity Review Board, and they review the maternal deaths in the area and determine the causes and the disparities from those reviews. And finally, we also have ABCO, the African American Breastfeeding Coalition of Oregon, who through work with several different organizations, culture specific organizations here in the area, are actually uh, working to improve access and information for community members to increase the number of Black women who are breastfeeding longer than six months here in Oregon. Are there any questions? 
Um, is one of you going to read the uh, proclamation? Yes, Ms. Larisha is. Yes. Are we ready? I think so. Then we'll have questions after the proclam after you oh. read it. Okay. All right. Proclaiming September 2021 as Infant Mortality Awareness Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds, whereas Multnomah County is committed to reducing infant mortality and improving the health outcomes of Black and Indigenous mothers and babies through respectful community, clinical practices, and interventions, and whereas September is Infant Mortality Awareness Month, an initiative that supports and inspires people from around the nation to take action to support in support of the goal to improve health and well being of women, infants, children, and families. And whereas Infant Mortality Awareness Month is an initiative intended to celebrate infants living beyond their first year of life. And whereas racial inequities in infant mortality rates persist among Black, African American, and Native Indigenous communities in Multnomah County and are the result of barriers in healthcare, employment, and community settings as well as racial and ethnic discrimination and whereas Multnomah County recognizes the benefits of building on the strength and wisdom of our communities raising up needed changes to support health and both baby for both babies and mothers and the importance of reducing racial disparities in health care and birth outcomes for babies and whereas National Infant Mortality Awareness Month provides opportunities for our community to get involved and support Multnomah County Health Department, maternal, parent, child, family health, healthy birth initiatives, future generations collaborative, and other partners in Multnomah County, and the opportunity to encourage government agencies, community-based organizations, healthcare systems, and academic institutions to work together to engage in equity efforts in their communities to eliminate disparities in infant mortality in our, our county. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaim September 2021 as Infant Mortality Awareness Month in Multnomah County, Oregon, in recognition and celebration of this importance of each child born in our community celebrating their first birthday and living healthy and rewarding lives. Adopted this day of September 16, 2021. Thank you. All right, I know that the commissioners have comments that they would like to make or maybe some questions. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Dreyfall. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much, um, Larisha, Disha, and Susie. I think that last sentence of the proclamation really captured it all, the importance of, of every single every single life, you know, continuing on to first year and beyond. Um, so thank you so much for this, pro for the proclamation, for the presentation, for the work that you do. We all talk about the importance of getting upstream and can't get much more upstream than this. It really is so critical to the health of our community. Um, really appreciated the focus on racial disparity and the fact that we are working in very intentional ways to address those disparities. Love the photographs, um, Susie, the, the photographs of the placecape just made me smile as well as of um, the groups of people that we saw all through the proclamation. Um, I guess one, one question, you know, I, I so appreciate the partnership between HBI and the nurse family partnership, all, all of the partnerships, but that, that one um, is, is such a seamless partnership. Um, and I had the chance to go out with folks in the nurse family partnership a couple of years ago, I think back in 2019, and I got a chance to see how important, like how crucial that personal connection is. So I'm curious, you've had to adapt so much during COVID. Um, you know, what are the kinds of things that you've done to, to continue to maintain that connection, even when you've, I assume, had to cut back a little bit on the personal contact, especially at the early stages? Well, um, ironically, right before COVID happened and we the shut-in came about, we were just piloting our telework piece. So instead of us doing a pilot, we just went full on with it and uh, went to exclusive visits with um, both face-to-face -face virtually and over the phone. And um, with everyone being shut in, we really encouraged more of the video conferencing versus the telephone. So that was one way. Um, of course, there were extreme needs still out there. So we partnered with um, like our resources, food boxes. We still 
we entered into an agreement with um, Portland Diaper Bank. And so we made diapers available. That was something we had them available before, but not at, on this scale. So it's a regular part of our rotation now. And so they were still able to do drop off. There's no visits or anything, but still maintaining that connection. And that's just one way of just, you know, I see you. Are you okay? How are you doing from afar saying hello? Um, yeah, so that that's just an example. And we also did, um, we had boxes that we partner with um, through the ELC Health Share and some other organizations where we were able to give out like toys, age appropriate learning toys and books and such. So we continued that practice as well. And again, just really trying to really stay engaged through the telehealth visits. Well, really appreciate that. And as you said, you know, so much gratitude to your team for continuing to do this and to pivot and be creative while themselves dealing with the pandemic. And one of the things that I think about as I, you know, as, as, as you were talking just now is that what, what you do and what these services provide is all of those really crucial early interventions and very practical ways, but also it occurs to me, you are really building trust between communities and the healthcare system in communities that have not had a lot of trust in the healthcare system for, for um, you know, accurate reasons. And so there, there's this additional piece of starting this relationship early to show that there are there are things that our healthcare systems can do if done right, the way you're doing them, um, to serve people throughout their lives. So anyway, thank you so much for all of your work um, and for the presentation and the proclamation. Really, really appreciate you all. Thank you. Commissioner Becky Peterson. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you so much, um, Marisha and um, Disha and Susie for all of their work on this. Um, I really appreciated the um, the talk about the disparities that we're seeing in Multnomah County and really hearing about the very, very focused work that's going on to um, decrease those um, disparities in the Black community and then the Native community. Um, you know, it's that work and, and how it needs to be done here in Multnomah County is so important. And, and then especially as we're looking at like nationwide and just the fact that we, for an industrialized nation, like the United States is such a, has such poor showing and such a really um, tragic record in, in infant mortality. Um, you know, there's so much more that we can be doing and should be doing. And I just really, um, I'm always proud when we hear about, to hear about the work that Multnomah County is doing around this. Um, you know, um, Disha, welcome to, to the HBI team. It's such a, we get to hear about the great work that happens all of the time. And um, some of our favorite things to see, especially all those great photographs of like moms and kids and babies, love that stuff. Um, and then uh, Susie, I just wanted to say, like I really appreciated the opening with Life is Sacred and, and then showing the graphs where, you know, you really see that the child and the family is surrounded and supported by um, so many different programs and so many different people and so many and, and the systems, but really, um, you know, centering the child. And and I saw um, preschool for all was on one of the slides, and that made me proud. But that was also that's also the 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 the, the you know as we were creating preschool for all, that was the same kind of philosophy that we took with that was really centering the child's and family's experience and building that program. So it was great to see that um, you know in the work that you're doing as well. Um, well, I really oh. thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for Preschool for All, for Brooke Chalton, uh, and the way in which you, that has shown up uh, right in our playscape and in other ways. And so there's so much to be grateful for. And I wanted to add that not only am I grateful for what the work uh, that all of you have contributed, but also being in partnership with Baby Boosters and HBI. And what, as my grandmother would say, out of every challenge is an opportunity. And uh, it has been tremendously challenging to create those relationships that are so critical to building trust. But those tangibles that we had to grow, the, like the deliverables that she was, Larisha was talking about, uh, you know, sharing toys, books, doing, making the I love you books, having Shutterfly, you know, every family has an I love you book that is just about their child. Those are things that we might not have thought of other than this time. But as I say, I, I, a special gratitude to Preschool for All and all of the systems that have really showed up to participate. Yeah. 
Thank you, Susan. I have to say, Brooke Chilton Timmons, who you mentioned, is just an amazing person, and she cannot get enough kudos, and and you know, just for the amazing work and the amazing person that she is. So thank you for for noticing um, her and acknowledging her work too. Um, you know, I, I it was interesting that we're doing this today because um, in the in the uh, the NACO, which is like the National Association for County Officials, they have a large urban county caucus, and yesterday at the meeting that they were talking about two national. Um, pieces of legislation that are really on something that's so so interrelated to to infant mortality, which is maternal mortality. And so they were talking about the MAMA Act, which stands for Mothers and Offsprings Mortality and Morbidity Awareness Act, which is um, being um, going through Congress, and then the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, um, which is part of the Build Back Better plan. And both of these pieces of legislation aim to create awareness and establish resources to end maternal and infant mortality. Um, and they call on like the CDC to establish guidelines and, and do anti-bias training for healthcare workers that look working at the perinatal workforce level um, to inset, set, and setting um, funding levels. And then they're really investing in minority serving um, institutions like um, historical black colleges and tribal serving universities to fund research around um, maternal health. Um, and I just think that this is like, you know, part of the a, a big push that we have to do nationally and locally to really um, to really address this issue in the right way and, and to um, and to lower the rates that are way too high. Um, so, you know, I think it would be great if this board put forward a letter in support of those two pieces of legislation. So we'll be sending around a letter um, around that um, in, in a couple of days. Um, but um, I really just appreciate the presentation and, and this proclamation to give awareness to these issues and to give awareness to all of the great work that's happening. So thank you so much. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is such uh, an impressive presentation. And I look around at, at, at Susie and Larisha and, and Disha and think, wow, what incredible leadership we have in our community. And I, I, I wanna thank you. And I know that there are lots of others that aren't with us today uh, that are helping uh, you with all of this work. And it, it makes me really, uh, it, it's absolutely unacceptable. The infant and uh, maternal uh, mortality that this country experiences in an industrial industrialized nation. But what it does tell me is that Multnomah County and our partners are on the right track when this board declared that racism is a public health crisis. And we know that we see that in the data and it's absolutely unacceptable. But uh, leaders like you and the organizations that you represent uh, I, I love what you said, Susie, uh, you were talking about culture is protective. And uh, and it made me a little bit envious that um, uh, I didn't have access to my culture when I was growing up. And uh, so that's something that, that I haven't had the opportunity to experience. And so when I see it in other cultures, I, I it always just kind of brings something uh, inside of me that, that it makes me kind of wish that I would have had that same opportunity. So keep doing what you're doing. I think it's super important, uh, you know, and, and the playscapes. And I love seeing, uh, I think you call them like the infant nest and I think of the baby board, uh, all of those uh, things that we, sometimes I think we think take things for granted and we don't really realize the impact that it has uh, on our, our children and our families. And uh, to see that uh, is just really, really heartwarming. Uh, you know, and and uh, Desha about the doulas, uh, absolutely training more uh, BIPOC uh, folks to be able to deliver those services is is so important, uh, and and really just just the love. Uh, I mean, I the fact that we have an all woman board. Um, all of us are moms, many of us are mo moms, and I I can't help but think that that brings such a different perspective. Uh, how we address infant mortality. And I know that you all bring that same heart and passion to the work that you do every day. And I just wanna thank you for being here and for calling this out and working on this important issue. And let's get those numbers uh, going uh, e even smaller. So thank you so much for being here. I'll just add my thanks to you all as well um, for being here today, for sharing this time with us, bringing this proclamation forward, but mostly for the work that you do day in and day out. And um, I think Commissioner Stegman talked about the fact that we are all moms and we so support the work that you do to ensure that that 
moms and, and dads and families and babies in our community are safe. Um, so, uh, all of the work that we do um, on the other end, trying to ensure that people can get their lives back together after they've been had struggles, we know that moving upstream, the work that you do to connect moms, babies, parents to their community is pays dividends in, in the years to come, as well as creates the really strong community that, that we want to have and we will look forward to having. So thank you again, um, everyone for coming today and appreciate the work that you do. Uh, Tasha, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Person? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori. Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for always supporting this much needed, so important area of work. Yeah. You know we do. 100%. Thank you. Care. R4, proclaiming September 2021 as Recovery Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. And I think it's actually R5, but who's counting? Who's kicking us off this morning? I'd like to start. Thank you, Chuck Corey and Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Lynn Smith Stodd. I'm the supervisor for the Office of Consumer Engagement for the Behavioral Health Division. It's always a pleasure to celebrate Recovery Month with you, and this year is especially important to me because I celebrated my 40th anniversary in recovery last week. The theme this year is recovery is for everyone, every individual, every family, every community. And I thought about that and realized that 40 years ago, recovery seemed like it was something for everyone but me. I just didn't think that I could find the path to wellness. And it was only through stories of hope and inspiration that I began to find my way. And that's why we have brought two speakers here today to share their stories of hope with you. Nationally, we've been celebrating this for 32 years. There are lots of community events that celebrate this and I think help reduce stigma, which is so important to allowing people to seek the services that they need. The people who are speaking to you today are especially inspiring. They have been able to sustain their path of recovery in spite of some of the challenges of COVID, and they have contributed to healthier families and healthier communities. I like to take a broad definition of recovery, and I tend to believe that most of us are recovering from something that challenges us to become our full potential. And so I really want to urge people this year to take some action to promote their own wellness, whatever that looks like, as well as support other people in recovery. And with that, I'll turn it over to DeAndre, who will introduce our speakers, followed by the proclamation. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, always a pleasure to see you, Chair, and the commissioners. Thank you for having us. Uh, this is my favorite time of the year. Uh, this is where we get to honor Recovery Month, and I'm excited about both of our speakers. I know them personally, and I've got to watch them through their whole journey of recovery. I consider both of them uh, my friends. And, um, you know, I, if you guys don't know, I'm the Office of Consumer Engagement Coordinator here at the county, and uh, my clean date is uh, August 14, 2015. I just celebrated six years last month. Uh, and I just love recovering. It's given me my whole world back. It's, it's allowed me to uh, create family, community, uh, and find a sense of self. And I just want to also honor, um, take some time to honor the, the members of our community we've lost through this pandemic this year. Uh, there's been um, an overwhelming rate of suicide, um, overdoses, uh, and people dying during this pandemic. So. Uh, and those who have stayed here, I want to thank you guys for staying. So we're going to kick it off. My, I'm excited to hear uh, Malcolm speak. We're going to turn it over to Malcolm and let him go first, and he, Charm will follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, you're on mute. 
sorry. Um, good morning, Chairperson Kapori and commissioners. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to come and talk to you about recovery and to celebrate recovery month. And thank you, DeAndre, especially for reaching out to me. <clears throat> My clean day is 12, 26, 15. DeAndre is, um, was one of the people I met first um, when I came out of the detox and into the shelter, um, the eight by eights, um, at uh, Eighth and Burnside. And um, so I'll say a little bit about my story. Um, I came here to Portland from uh, Oakland, California. I'm a Bay Area native. I was raised, grew up in Philadelphia. Um, I had been living in the Bay, you know, almost 25 years. Um, and when I was in my mid 40s, I began using drugs pretty heavily um, in the midst of like, by all accounts, a pretty successful career. Um, and I'd had a book published that year, uh, my first book, and uh, it was pretty exciting. And and one way my life was taken off, I was in the news and my book was selling really well. And my personal life was just tanking. And um, my addiction got worse and worse. I became homeless. Um, my kids stopped talking to me and my parents pretty much disowned me. And I went from being somebody who was the center of my family and very much like the center of, of social life and really proud of myself to somebody who was homeless and living out of his car. Um, and it was really hard. And I came to Portland and things got worse before they got better. <laughs> and then uh, I went to, uh, I became homeless again. Somebody had me come up here and I became homeless again. Um, put myself in detox and went to rehab and spent eight months, almost eight months in residential treatment um, through Central City Concern and particularly the Imani program. And so thank God, because they helped me save my life. You know, I can tell you without any doubt that if I was still actively using, um, I would probably, I would definitely not be sitting here at my farm. And I'll turn my camera around. I hope you can see it because it's beautiful. Um, I'll just turn the camera around. So I definitely wouldn't be here sitting on this beautiful farm um, in the middle of Southeast Portland farming vegetables with my newly married wife. Um, I wouldn't be doing this. I would probably be, you know, I don't know what I would be doing, but it wouldn't be anything positive and good. Uh, and so, you know, I got out. Um, and I hit the ground running. I tried to uh, get a job right away and um, was able to get housing and I'm still in the same apartment now. Um, here we are almost five years later. Uh, my kids are talking to me again, I'm working on another book um, in the very beginning stages of cramming this application to graduate school. Um, my farm is doing really well. We're called Black Futures Farm here in Southeast Portland um, or on Instagram and Facebook, you can check us out. <laughs> And it's great. My life is beautiful. I can't say anything. I, I had I never imagined even when I wasn't doing drugs that my life was going to be this good. And my life is the best it's ever been. Um, and so I'm very grateful to Central City Concern, to the city of Portland for welcoming me and for allowing me to make a home here and to be able to be uh, of service and, and provide service to the community. I was listening really intently to um, the ladies that came before us and talk about social services and Really serving is my passion and, and always I've always been a community servant for for know, the 30 or so years that I've been working and I really appreciate the net um, of care here in Portland. Um, and particularly around addiction, I think that our homeless problem is really accelerated by the fact that so many people are addicted. And I know um, not just from my own being a service recipient, but also a service provider that the more the wider and deeper we cast the net, the more people we can we can prevent from call, from falling down and becoming homeless and addicted and living in tents and you know just the home mania and the insanity that surrounds that life. And so, um, I just I'm very grateful for your work and I encourage you to keep digging deep and finding more resources and training more people and bringing more people who are former service recipients like myself, DeAndre Charm, um, to service providers because we know what to do. I also work part-time um, at Impact Northwest as a parent coach. 
and um, you know, always telling my my clients, hey, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And not only can you do it, you'll have to do it by yourself for some help. So that's it for me. I really appreciate you all. Thank you, um, Black Futures Farm, on all the social medias. Uh, again, my name is Malcolm Shabazz Hoover. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm grateful and thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce Shauna Lee. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharma Lee, and I'm a person in recovery. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, for allowing me to be here. For 17 years, I was stuck in the cycle of active addiction and was considered a lost cause by many. I suffered many consequences during this time, from incarceration and homelessness to dropping out of school and complete social and spiritual disconnect. I also experienced many serious medical issues, uh, including various infections related to IV drug use. One of these infections actually led to a spinal surgery that almost left me a paraplegic and another to open heart surgery where I received a valve replacement and a pacemaker at the age of 30. It was during one of these hospitalizations that I had my first experience with peer support through OHSU's impact team. And having that one person that didn't just see me as another junkie patient was invaluable. My experience with this peer support specialist was also uh, significant because it showed me that through the power of recovery, we can shatter stigma. I saw proof of this in the interactions between my peer mentor and the medical professionals on the impact team. He was an addict just like me, yet he was valued and treated with respect even by the doctors. This blew my mind and it planted a small seed of hope. It took about another year, but that seed finally began to sprout when one day I woke up and I decided that I was worthy of life and recovery too. I entered into Central City Concerns Recovery Mentor Program, and I am proud to say that I have been free from all mind altering substances since October 12th of 2019. After completing, I went on to their recovery employment, or excuse me, employment, employment recovery program, which helped me to reenter the workforce and society as a whole. I then moved out of transitional housing and went back to school where this past summer I graduated from Portland State University with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Fast forward to today, I am now working with the Mental Health and Addiction Association of Oregon, the same organization that provided me peer support at some of the lowest points of my life. Even more remarkable is that I get to work on a team which is led by the same peer support specialist I had at OHSU three years ago. To me, this is clear evidence of the power of recovery and of the peer movement in particular. In closing, I just want to say that I no longer regret my past, for it's because of my past, now despite it, that I became the woman of strength, integrity, compassion, and agency that I am today. I am no longer Charmely, the junkie, the criminal, or the lost cause. I am Charmely, a woman in recovery who has dedicated her life to serving her community and to helping others believe that they too are worthy of life. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Sean. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn or to, to you guys. I'll read the proclamation first, if that's okay. That would be great, thanks. Thank you. Proclaiming September 2021 as Recovery Month in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds Recovery Month is celebrated every September to increase awareness that prevention, treatment, and recovery services are available and effective in helping people with substance use disorders to succeed in achieving their goals for health and wellness. The 2021 national theme for Recovery Month is recovery is for everyone, every individual, every family, every community. Anyone can experience a substance use disorder that may lead to problems at work, school, or at home and affect the overall wellness of individuals, families, and communities. Some population groups are at much higher risk. These include persons from diverse backgrounds and cultures, rural residents, the LGBTQ plus community, older adults, persons with disabilities, and those experiencing houselessness with low income or low education and otherwise adversely impacted by social determinants of health. Many individuals who already struggle with substance misuse are also struggling with social, financial, and health disruptions during the COVID-19 epidemic. 
The ongoing epidemic of racism and racial unrest of the past year have coincided with prolonged isolation and hardships brought on by the virus. Oregon saw a near 40% increase in overdose fatalities in 2020. There are multiple routes to treatment and recovery. There is no one right method that works for everyone. It's important for each individual to choose what is right for them. And remember that recovery is ongoing and not time limited. Many individuals live with both substance use disorders and mental health challenges. Multnomah County recognizes the need for integrated behavioral health treatment. Behavioral health is vital to overall health and well being and should be treated with the same urgency as physical health. Substance use is identified as a social indicator of health. People who face substance use disorders are often excluded from positive social engagement and opportunities, which can lead to shortened lifespans and a host of other social and health challenges. Engaging in meaningful prevention work, including peer recovery support, changes life outcomes in healthy ways. People experiencing substance use or mental health issues should be free from stigma and able to participate fully in their community with access to appropriate health care, safe and healthy housing, economic opportunity, and support from community members. People in recovery need community support to thrive, and communities thrive when people experience increased wellness. Multnomah County is committed to helping all residents experiencing behavioral health challenges by providing an array of services that are accessible, culturally specific, and responsive, and supported by peers with similar lived experience. Individuals can and do recover. Multnomah County celebrates this month in recognition of the fact that every individual's journey of recovery contributes to healthier communities, including improved relationships with families and friends, increased stability in employment and housing, and opportunities to use their lived experience to pr promote recovery for others. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims the month of September 21 is proclaimed to be recovery month in Multnomah County, Oregon. All county residents are invited to celebrate this year's theme. Recovery is for everyone, every individual, every family, every community, which emphasizes the important role we all play in supporting recovery for individuals, families, and communities impacted by substance use disorders. People can and do recover. There is hope and help is available. We invite all residents to share their stories of hope and recovery and observance of this month. Adopted this 16th day of September 2021. Thank you, Chair, Commissioners. And thank you, Charmely and Malcolm. I so appreciate your stories. They keep me going every day. Thank you all. I um, know commissioners would like to uh give you their appreciation, their comments, and maybe a question or two, but we're going to start. Lynn, did you have a um, statement from Commissioner Myron that she wanted to be read? I do. Thank you, Chair Corey. Give me just a moment here. Commissioner Myron says, I am so sorry I could not be present for today's proclamation, celebrating an uplifting recovery month. I especially miss not being there to hear people share their stories. For me, this is always the most powerful part of the program. If history is any predictor, if I were there, I would be wiping away tears right now. But sharing stories is not just inspiring, it is essential to the recovery movement. Our understanding of substance use disorder and recovery has evolved and changed as a direct result of people sharing their stories and persisting in cha changing the questions we ask the research we conduct, and the policies we produce to better meet people's needs. This past year and a half has been especially challenging with the intersection of so many crises, economic, health-related, environmental, and the continued structural racism and violence toward individuals and communities spurred by hate. The isolation has been devastating for so many, and so it is even more important to hear that recovery is possible. We can come through this, you are not alone and there is truly hope. I really love this year's theme because it speaks to everyone. The fields I've worked in, medicine and politics, haven't traditionally been safe open spaces for people to identify as in recovery. But in reality, all the spaces in which we live, work and play in all of our communities include people in recovery. Through elevating and sharing stories of experience in recovery, 
across professions, ages, and cultures, and race and gender, we can create real meaningful inclusion. What's more, these stories have inspired a movement for policies and funding that change lives. Access to services and treatment is the key to recovery for many people. And right now, during a period of unprecedented need, that access is seriously hindered by a behavioral health workforce crisis. These are challenging and often underpaid jobs. We need an immediate and significant investment in the state to level and stem the tide of departures from this field. I truly wish I were present, virtually of course, to celebrate with you, but I am there in spirit. Thank you to all the presenters and speakers and to our amazing team in the Behavioral Health Division. I wish you all a happy recovery month. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn and Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Um, you know, I, I Commissioner Myron said better than I can say much of what I was thinking, including that the sharing of stories is not not only inspiring, which it absolutely is. Every single one of you inspired me today, um, but essential in order to change change policy, change practice, and to really become inclusive of all people in recovery. Um, Sharma Lee, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, thank you for highlighting in this really intentional and specific way the importance of peer support services. It is beautiful, just beautiful to hear that the person that you're working with right now is the person who provided you that support. Um, I am so glad and grateful that you decided that you are worthy of life um, and that by modeling that you will convince others that they are too. Um, Malcolm, uh, thank you for sharing your story. What what an inspiring story. Also, uh, I have absolutely written down Black Futures Lab, and we'll look it up on social media, and um, hope to hope to uh, perhaps taste some of your your food. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's Black Futures Farm. I'm so sorry. I, I'm, that's okay. I, <laughs> Black Futures Lab is Alicia Garza. That's one of the co-founders of BLM. It's, that's, yes. She's awesome too. She's a friend of mine. <laughs> But this is Black Futures Farm. We stole her name. We stole our name from her. <laughs> Can't be bad to be in her company, right? <laughs> thank you for the correction. Um, and I, you know, I think I just I just want to thank you for for what you said about your belief in community service and for being a community servant in our community. I think we're so so lucky to have you. Um, and your story, all of the stories today show that change, in fact, is possible. And I'm really really grateful for that. DeAndre, thank you always for showing up and for being a passionate and authentic spokesperson for this work and for all people in recovery. Um, I, I'm always inspired and grateful, inspired by and grateful for your work. And I was so moved when you said um, it has given me my whole world back. That that's what we're that's what we want everybody in recovery to feel. And then finally, Lynn. Thank you always for your dedication to this work and for your showing up and sharing your story with us and, and every day. Um, I love the theme recovery is for everyone. And I loved what you said about the fact that most of us are recovering from something that is an essential truth. And I think it's, it's a way to, to talk about recovery that allows everybody to see that we're all in this together and that helps prevent the othering that that we also can see happen. So um, really, really appreciative. And, and, you know, you talked about stigma and I think that that concept that everybody's recovering from something helps to remove the stigma as well. So thank you for framing it that way. Give me, give me a new way to think and talk, talk about it as well. So um, again, just so much gratitude for, for your work, each and every one of you and for sharing yourselves and your story. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, this is this is um, always such a moving and um, just really important proclamation that we do each year. And um, and I agree with what um, Commissioner Jayapal and Commissioner Myron have said about the importance of sharing stories. It is such a um, it's such a beautiful part of this proclamation, but it also um, is such an important part of. Um, being able to share experiences so that people who are hearing it, people who are um, listening, you know, can hear what others have gone through. Um, I and and each and every um, 
you know, story that you've said, experiences that are different from different people as they're going through recovery, um, the more those stories are shown, the, those mo more those stories are told, it, the more it is obvious that recovery is possible for everyone. Everyone from different backgrounds, different ways of life, different ways that they've um, come through recovery, right? But it, there is a path for everyone. Um, and just appreciate the, the the honesty and the bravery and the trust in, in sharing the stories um, with us today. Um, you know, and, um, you know, congratulations, everyone. There's there. It sounds like there had been um, either um, this month or last month, like some really great anniversaries and recoveries. So um, Lynn and DeAndre, congratulations on your years in recovery. Um, DeAndre, I wanted to thank you for touching on the overdose impacts of the pandemic, because I think that is something that um, is 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 a is a fact of the pandemic that hasn't gotten enough um, attention as we're looking at how um, how all of us have been impacted by this and and really the costs of the pandemic for um, for folks and I think that um, the overdoses we're seeing is is a part of it and has to be part as we're talking about what like a just economic recovery a just just recovery from pandemic looks like like we have to um, be recognizing the impact that overdoses have and and um, and and supporting that work um, as part of our recovery too. Um, Malcolm, uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories. I really would love to come out and visit the Black Futures Farm. I think it sounds like it's in my district if you're out in Southeast Portland. Um, I love urban farms and especially those that like really are about connecting food to immigrant and BIPOC communities. Um, so, um, so that's just really great work and I really appreciate um, what you are, you know, that you're here in Portland, that you're doing this incredible work um, and and um, and that you've shared your story with us today about how recovery has led you to this place. Um, Sharmali, thank you so much um, for for sharing your story too. I also like Commissioner Jai Paul really thought that um, it was special to share how your first experience with peer support that got you on the path to recovery is now a part of the work you do and the role that you have. And um, I think that's just an incredibly powerful story. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn, for all the work that you do. Um, I will say out um, out here where I live in this neighborhood, DePaul Treatment Center is constructing a new 70 bed facility um, out here behind the target. And every day I drive past it at least once or twice a day. And you know, I every time it's being built, I'm I'm seeing like I see it as a place of hope and healing. And I'm like, we just need to get this done as fast as possible. And we also knew we need to be doing so much more of that kind of investment and building those kinds of facilities so that we can support um, and have resources for people who are. Um, looking to get on the path of recovery. So, um, so I'm really grateful for for that building, and and really um, am looking forward to how we can how we can continue to push those kinds of investments um, that we need in this community, this in this state, in this country. So, thanks to everyone. Um, again, like really grateful for you for you being here today and sharing your stories um, and for what you're doing for our community. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Lynn and DeAndre and uh, Sharma Lee uh, and Malcolm. Your stories um, were so moving and inspirational. I, I think that probably most all of us um, have family members, friends, and who've been impacted, if, if not ourselves, um, by recovery. And I know that. Uh, some friends and family uh, of mine that, you know, their recovery birth date is actually almost more important than their real birth date. And so I want to say happy birthday to all of you and congratulations. Uh, we know that there's not one singular path to recovery and the vulnerability that you've all shown today and the authenticity uh, that you've shared with us is just so moving. And for you to bring your whole self uh, so that you can provide hope and encouragement to other people uh, is it, just so important because I, I hope and I believe that if other people look at the circumstances that you all were able to uh, rise above, that they can look at you and they can say, if they did it, I can do it. And so, um, I know when I look at you, I'm, I'm just so very proud of what each one of you has individually accomplished. And I know that it wasn't easy, uh, but the fact that you're standing here and sharing your stories with us and others so that maybe they don't have to go what you went through is so powerful and so important. 
So I just want to appreciate each and every one of you for your journeys and thank you for sharing your stories with us. Thank you everyone for helping us to celebrate and to proclaim recovery month. And I'm just going to add on my praise here. I'm, I'm really full of such gratitude to each of you um, that you've been able to take your experiences um, that are inherently painful and, and destructive and turn transform them into something that's beautiful and positive. Um, one of the things that I love most about Recovery Month is that in opening up conversations about recovery and destigmatizing and normalizing it, it gives people who are in recovery more freedom to be and to express their full authentic selves. And when you're able to do that and when you're able to come here and share your stories with us and with the public, we know that people who are struggling with addiction and substance use disorders can and do find hope in your story uh, to see that recovery really is possible. And I think right now that need for hope is so much more widespread than than we can even realize. I don't know anyone who hasn't been touched by um, a substance use disorder, whether it's their own or a family member or a friend or a coworker. And the need for hope has only grown during this pandemic. Um, I'm, I'm just encouraged that there are people like you who have continued to reach out and give back to others who are starting their own recovery journeys. And I'm really grateful that Multnomah County can be a part of those stories by connecting people to the treatment, the services, and the support that they need. So please keep sharing your stories and keep shining that beacon of hope that others can follow. Um, I, this this day, this proclamation that we do every year is so important to not just each of you and not just to our community, but I think to our organization at Multnomah County. All of my staff right now are watching and um, sending me snippets about how hopeful they feel. And one person who used to work at Central City Concern did mention that Malcolm also has a, he talked about his book and I'm sure that this is, but he's a poet. And um, I hope that next time we see and hear from him, he will share with some of his poetry with us. So thank you. Um, thank you all. I appreciate each and every one of you. And um, with that, Tasia, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. And Chair Kafori? Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you, thank you to all of you. All right, now we have, um, that finishes up our agenda items. We now have comment time for board members to comment or make comments on any non-agenda items. And I'm going to start this time with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to remind you folks that we are having our virtual issue form today at three o'clock with uh, District Attorney Schmidt. Uh, he's going to uh, share with us his first year in office and what he sees uh, the future of the District Attorney's office where uh, that's going. So please join us. Uh, you can find a link on, on my Facebook page or on my county website. And that's three o'clock today. Commissioner Vega Peterson. I don't have anything for this week. All right, Commissioner Jayapal. Neither do I. And neither do I. So that means we've come to the end of our meeting. Don't fear, there's more. We will be back next week on Tuesday, September the 21st, 10 a.m. for our board briefing. See you then, if not before. Stay safe, stay healthy. We are adjourned.